Hi, my name is Paul, and I'm the pastor of Livingstone's Christian Reformed Church in Sacramento, California, on Florin Road. And I've been doing what's essentially a commentary series on, on Jordan Peterson's biblical series. And um, this is my what, my fourth video on just his first one. His first, his first, uh, the biblical series number one, I think, is a prolegomena, and in theological language that that gets at the basis the foundation uh where does where does this come from and and jordan peterson at this on this one we're going to get into what i think is the meat of the first um introduction to the idea of god's of that video where peterson really gets into the question of where does the bible come from because in many ways, before we know why we should listen to something, we want to know where the Bible comes from. Uh, someone who watched asked a question about this. I got this from uh, Derek Zile, who now pastors in Whitensville, Massachusetts, when he finished his internship with me. And this image, or this picture is called In His Image. And that's a picture of Jesus. And he's kind of made up of, of all these faces, often of uh, some famous people in the 20th century. So that's where that picture comes from. And today I'm wearing a hat because it's cold. And I pastor a small church. And we don't have a lot of money. So I don't see the point of having the heat on while I'm in here during the day, often by myself. So I keep the heat down and I wear something heavy. And I wear a hat because I'm going bald. And that's just the way of the age of decay. So let's jump in and I want to begin with Peterson and um, and what again what I think is really the the meat of this first video where he really gets into Jung and his ideas of this semi dream state and so on and so forth. And just to some of those who've been trying to help me get up to speed into YouTube. Yes, I am wearing an earpiece, and that's how I'll monitor it, so hopefully we don't have any echoing in the video. I will sometimes want to mute this because I tested it out, and basically if the mic is on, it picks me up shifting and breathing, and, and then people are going to look at this video and say, what's with that weird guy with the big nose with the heavy breathing, breathing on Jordan Peterson video? So uh, I might mute it sometimes. Hopefully I'll avoid the error of having it muted when I talk. So let's jump in and and get to what I think again is the meat of the Jordan Peterson's biblical series number one. Anyways, back to Jung. Jung was a great believer in the dream, and I noted that dreams will tell you things that you don't know. And then I thought, well, how the hell can that be? How the in the world can something you think up tell you something you don't know. How does that make any sense? First of all, why don't you understand it? Why does it have to come forth in the form of the dream? It's like you're not, there's something going on inside you that you don't control, right? The dream happens to you just like life happens to you. I mean, there is the odd lucid dreamer who can, you know, apply a certain amount of conscious control, but most of the time it's, you're laying there asleep and this crazy complicated world manifests itself inside you and you don't know how you could you can't do it when you're awake and you don't know what it means it's like what the hell is going on and that's one of the things that's so damn frightening about the psychoanalysts because well let's hold off before he goes into the psychoanalysts but th this point about dreams is really important because you, you'll find it in the bible um in daniel when daniel's dealing with nebuchadnezzar uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and it bothers him and Daniel interprets it. Daniel's kind of an echo of Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. And, and dreams for people all around the world have, have always assumed that dreams are messages from the gods. Now I talked in my last little, my last video about the buffered self and that's, that's an artifact of our culture that, that we believe ourselves to be buffered and so, you know, that's, it's, it's just us in, in our bubble. Now, I, before I worked in Sacramento, I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic and I worked with Haitians and Dominicans and Haitians were a big believer in dreams. And, and I remember one woman, uh, comes up to me one day. And at this point, my wife and I only had one child. I, I have five children, but my wife and I only had one child and, and a doctor had once told her that, you know, for some reason I won't go into that, oh, you, you probably will have difficulty conceiving. And, and that had been our experience. And at that point, we'd had one child. 
and this this Haitian woman comes up to me and says, um, you know, missionary, missionary, I got to talk to you. I said, okay. I said, I dreamed about you last night. I said, you dreamed about me. What did you dream about? He says, you were, you were, you were surrounded by flowers and fruit and, and I dreamed about you and you're surrounded by flowers and fruit. I said, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, that means you're going to have many children. And I laughed and, you know, getting into the Genesis story, I'm kind of like Sarah laughing. You're going to have many children. I have one and, you know, it doesn't look like we're terribly fertile. And uh, now we have five. So what did that dream mean? Why did she dream about you? Um, in Is it in Inside Out, In and Out, the the Pixar movie? Um, one, of, one of what I, part of what I, you know, I liked a lot of things about that movie. It was a fun movie. One of the things I didn't like was the dream sequence because the dream sequence was so disconnected with the rest of life. And and anybody who pays any attention to their dreams knows, you know, if there's something you're anxious about and you go to bed, you'll dream about it. When I was in college, I never stayed up late to study because I have pretty quickly figured out that, you know, having a fresh mind was probably the best asset going into a test. If um, I would study the night before, and, and, and we all know that if you have to make a big decision, you have to buy a car, you have to buy a house, uh, you have a big decision to make in your career, you know, long time we've said, well, go and sleep on it. And, and a lot of brain scientists have talked about, well, when you sleep on it, your brain processes it, and this other, this other part of your brain, all of these personalities are working on it, and you wake up in the morning and boom. Part of, you know, for myself, when I, when I wait, one of the first things I do when I wake up in the morning is I, is I usually pray. And then that's when I get to work. I get to work either on my outline for my next video here, or I'm working on my sermon, or I'm working on a blog post, or I'm, because I'm, I'm the freshest. And, and often I will wake up and if there's something I've been mulling over, I'll, you know, I'll, in the morning, it'll be clear. And, and this is a this is a nearly universal experience, and and we know this about dreams. Now, now as Peterson talks about dreams, it's important to realize that when he's talking about dreams, he's not always talking about literal dreams. He's talking about this kind of dream world, this this the world like it is when we're in our dreams. Now, if you listen to his his classes, the the maps of meaning and the personality and trans uh, transformations classes, he gets more into the dreams. And, and he gets into, you know, what, what, what's happening with the right and the left side of the brain. One side of the brain seems to perhaps be uh, dealing more with, with what we've already been art, able to articulate. And, and the other side of the brain is, is dealing with what we haven't yet been able to put into words. And part of the reason I'm doing these videos is because I'm watching Peterson and I'm digesting what he's saying. And and part of what's part of what's interesting is that, and I think part of why we're taking so long to get through this first video, this this prolegomena, is is some sections of this video are really packed with a lot of, uh, you know, very important dense material. Now I I knew almost nothing about Jung before I started listening to Jordan Peterson. So as I usually do, if if something interests me, I pick up a book and I start reading, or I listen to audio books, and and so I've been making my way through Jung's autobiography which is a which is a fascinating book and um right now at the period where he's a he's a teenager and he's rejecting christianity and i'm listening to the reasons he's rejecting christianity and this is towards the end of the 19th century and i'm thinking you know not a lot has changed in some ways when i when i listen to skeptics and friends of mine who have given up on christianity a lot of the reasons that jung had were were, were some of the reasons that that i hear from people the the problem, the problem of evil question, uh, the questions of science. Jung at one point in the book says, you know, I read the Bibles and then I read the Bible and then there are miracles. And so I dismiss it. We're going to talk about that a little bit in this video. But again, see, I'm, I, I ramble like Peterson. I go down a rabbit trail too undisciplined as speaker. It's probably why my church is so small. But so, so here we are with these dreams. And, and so we wonder what on earth are these dreams for? What do they do? Why have people throughout the centuries believed that God speaks to them through their dreams? Why is that such a common motif in the Bible? And well, let's let's keep going with this. Because you get this both from Freud and Jung, you really start to understand that there are things inside you that are happening that control you instead of the other way around. You know, there's a bit of reciprocal control, but there's manifestations of spirits, so to speak, inside you that determine 
the manner in which you walk through life. And, and I think as a, as you know, so Peter, one, again, one of the things I appreciate about Peterson is that he's a clinician and that not all of his information, you know, I talked in the last time about the, um, about the rational or the, uh, why can't I think of them? Basically, from above, which is kind of the rationalism, and then from below, which is the empiricism. And and I tend to prefer I tend to prefer authors that have hands on both sides because I think I think and science actually is where these two things come together. But and that's that's part of the reason I I enjoy my job. On one hand, some of you might, if you're watching my channel, you see on one hand I have these Jordan Peterson videos, and then you see the Freddie and Paul show, and you think, well, what the heck is with that Freddie and Paul show? Who is this guy, Freddie? Well, Freddie is a um, baptized member of this church. His family's a member of this church. Um, you know, Freddie's got his challenges in life, and Freddie comes to me one day and says, you know, I want to do a TV show with you. And I thought, well, I, I don't. I'm not going to really do a TV show with you, even though in many ways I think life around my church is kind of like a, a reality comedy show. But but with but Freddie's like, well, I I want to do this, and so I enjoy doing this with Freddie. I enjoy, you know, looking at life, and I enjoy reading the Bible, and I enjoy both the theoretical, the intellectual, and the the grassroots normal. I. You know, I if you watch the show, Freddie and Gordon and I went out, you know, went out to lunch. And I love going to lunch with those guys because because in the picture of the world, these people mean nothing. But if you if you if you actually sit down and listen, you can learn a ton about life and, and you can learn that that people are amazing. And so as a pastor in a in a distressed community, in a in a little rather forgotten corner of Sacramento, I, I relish this. I've I've often I often deal with the homeless. I my church is incredibly diverse, ethnically, racially, um, socioeconomically, and, and I love getting the slice of life from all these different and then and then trying to piece this together. See, I went down another rabbit trail. Sorry. So so Peterson notes the the psychoanalytic and and. You know, I think I think they're dead on right. People don't know what they do or why they do it. Why does Freddie want to do a TV show? Why? Where does Freddie come up with his? You know, last Sunday he wants to dance on the show, and it's like, where does this come from? And okay, well, go ahead. You know, it's no harm done here, and we'll figure it out. So people do what they. Again, getting back to the Apostle Paul, people do what they don't want to do, and they don't want to do what they do, and and there's all these motivations in us. And of course, you know, if you if you study any psychology or or are a therapist or meet a smart therapist, you begin to realize, boy, these you know people are complicated. And and on one hand, nobody knows me better than me, and on another hand, I am more a mystery to me than I am to the people around me. The people around me, to a certain degree, know me better than me, but to another degree, I can only know myself to the degree that I can. And it's 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 an amazing thing, and I think that is that is some of the that is some of the the amazing contributions of the psychotherapists and of this of this um, representational anthropology that says we are complex and and we are. You know there are multitudes of people within us. Some of the people that um, some of the people that I work with hear voices, and there's a lot of interesting theories on what are they hearing when they hear voices. And often I'll ask them, well, what what are, what are you hearing? And and when they tell me what the voices are saying, when I know their story very well, I think that makes sense that they're hearing voices to say that. Now, does it mean that they're hearing spirits? Um, I don't think so. In most cases, is that a possibility? Who am I to say no? And and we're going to get into a little bit later, you know, Peterson's um, Peterson's test in terms of let's not be too reductionistic. And and Peterson, you know, and I I think are pretty much on the same page in this. That you know, if someone says that they're hearing voices, my first option is okay. Well, let's look at a psychological reason. But I don't want to too quickly. I don't want to too quickly remove the possibility of other answers now um now that's always measured and we ought to be careful with that but you know and i find in c.s lewis who is another again uh, miracles tremendous book um another another person who, who had a really balanced approach to these kind of things so well let's get back to peterson 
and you don't control it. And what does? Is it random? You know, there are people who have claimed that dreams are mere, merely the consequence of random neuronal firing, which is a theory I think is absolutely absurd because there's nothing random about dreams. You know, they're very, very structured and, and very, very complex. And they're not like snow on a television screen or, or static on a radio. Like, those things are complicated. And, and then also I've seen so often that people have very coherent dreams that have a perfect narrative structure. You know, they're fully developed in some sense. And so that just doesn't, I, that theory just doesn't go anywhere with me. I just can't see that as useful at all. And so, so I'm more likely to take the phenomena seriously and say, well, there's something to dreams. Well, you dream of the future and then you try to make it into a reality. That seems to be an important thing. You know, or maybe you dream up a nightmare and try to make that into a reality because people do that too if they're hell-bent on revenge, for example, and full of hatred and resentment. I mean, that manifests itself in terrible fantasies. You know, those are dreams, then people go act them out. These things are powerful. You know, and whole nations can get caught up in collective dreams. That's what happened to the Nazis. That's what happened to Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And, and, and I think this, this point is, is important beyond the, the two illustrations Peterson is going to get that, because Jung will go there, that, that we, our dreams are not only individual to us, they're not just let's say, within the, the contemporary, the imminent frame. They're not just part of our buffered self. Our, our dreams are, are communal. And, and if you go on the web and see dream interpretation, people will come up with all kinds of ideas. But, but our dreams are communal. And so that's why dream, really, when we're using dream in this way, we're using dream as a metaphor because there are these things that we call dreams that we have, but we're really talking about something that's, that's way more than just what we're experiencing when we sleep at night. We're, we're talking about, as, as Charles Taylor calls, the, the imaginary. This is the, this is this social, this is this story that we inhabit. And as we go in, as I go on to this video, we're going to talk a lot more about story because I think dream, yes, story is really the better word. Uh, we, we, we cannot help but live in story. It, it could very well be a function of our consciousness. I don't, I, don't, I don't think we really understand why this is true about ourselves, but I think it is impossible to deny this is what's true about ourselves. And this is, this is why I think that when Brett Weinstein says, well, the material is the top level truth, I think as, as John Peugeot pushes back when they had kind of a three-way conversation, I, I think, I think, you can't say it's the top level truth without without in fact arguing about story and this is this is exactly where i think peterson is dead on right tagging the 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 postmodernists because the postmodernists say there's no governing narrative and they proceed to use that as a governing narrative and and i think if you say there's no governing narrative you just have to shut up and stop using language because well but then you're not going to know how to act and and in, in fact all of civilization then just stops. Well, let's get back to Peterson. It was an absolutely remarkable, amazing, horrific, destructive spectacle. And the same thing happened in the Soviet Union. The same thing happened in China. It's like, we have to take these things seriously, you know, and try to understand what's going on. So Jung believed that the dream could contain more information than was yet articulated. You think... And, and again, that, I think that's dead on right. That, that when in fact we dream, we are, we are processing information. Our brain is working on stuff. And, and this is, and, and, and this is, this is simply what we're doing. And this is something we have to do. Now, there's a lot of interesting science that I've read recently about dreams perhaps having an editing feature that, you know, what we experience in the process of a day is, is way too much for us to remember and so and so we we edit and we compress and we package and 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 we do this processing so that we can that we can stay sane and we can live in the midst of this incredibly complex world but but this so again dream story uh, and peterson's going to going to keep going with this artists do the same thing you know like people go to museums and they look at paintings Renaissance paintings or modern paintings, and they don't exactly know why they're there. You know, I, I was in this room in, in New York, I don't remember which museum, 
but it was a room full of Renaissance art, you know, great painters, the, the greatest painters, and thought maybe that room was worth a billion dollars or something outrageous because there was like 20 paintings in there, you know, so priceless. And the first thing is, well, why are those paintings worth so much? And why is there a museum in the biggest city in the world devoted to them? And why do people from all over the world come and look at them? What the hell are those people doing? One of them was of the Assumption of Mary, you know, beautifully painted, absolutely glowing work of art. And there's like 20 people standing in front of it looking at it. And you think. Now, now, I think this is a great illustration. And Peterson, I don't know if just because I've watched this video so many times or some of the other videos he made, I think this is a great illustration. But, but I think beneath this illustration is also um, the, it, it relies on the idea that, in fact, you know, who goes to a museum? I'm, I'm often struck. You, people will line up to go to Star Wars. And again, I'll get into the big stories at the end of this video. But people line up to go into Star Wars. And, and you, go into a, you go into a museum and you look, at these, you look at these Renaissance masters. And how many people are there? Well, not many. Um, it, it's, it's, you can appreciate these as you go deeper into the story. Now, now part, of, part of what I think is behind this big cultural conversation and this interest in Peterson, I think people like myself and many others, I've been just shocked that people actually watch these videos because uh, why would you? But but here's the question of motivation. Why do I make these videos? Well, I make these videos because I have to talk this stuff out because I have to try to package this stuff together. And, and this is all putting together the, the underlying story that when you go into a museum and you look at a Renaissance master, you, you, you need an education. Well, what is education? Education is getting up to speed on the story. It's, it's all of us getting our story together. In Jungian terms, it's, it's all of us collaborating on this dream. And, and none of us can articulate this story, yet it's a very real thing. And, and we have a sense of, well, when we talk about fandoms and stories, we have a sense of breaking canon. But, but at the same time, the, the story only stays interesting if we flex canon and, you know, again, as we get into the Bible, uh, this is this is in fact what the Bible does throughout the story. You know, people that what what strikes me, people who know almost nothing about the Bible, imagine that what's in the Bible is a is a list of rules, and that God put these rules in the Bible, and if you follow these rules, you go to heaven, and if you don't follow these rules, you go to hell. And and when people say that, I immediately know they don't really know the Bible. They don't know the Bible that well. They haven't read it. They haven't been marinated in it. They haven't understood how the Bible so often is is having is hosting conversations, and that's where you have the the hyperlink um, quality of the Bible. So, um, now where was I with Peterson? You know, he, he was talking about yeah, you, know, you go into these art museums, and you know what is it? We don't even know why we're fascinated, but yet at the same time, it's also the case that. I remember, so we have the Getty, if you take five down to Southern California, that's like one of the closest really amazing art museums and it's free. And so we go down to the Getty and I remember, you know, when my when my kids are young, they can take about 10 minutes. Says, it's just a painting. Let me get out of here. Uh, then when they get to be all teenagers, they can maybe deal with it 45 minutes or an hour. And then they get into their late teens. They've had enough education. And then suddenly... I'd, I'd kind of like to go to that place and look at those paintings. You know, they could take more, and it, so so it's it's a process of getting into the story together, and and then you have the conversation or the the point that Peterson is making is that how does how does a representation, you know, even a even a representation, hope it don't break anything, you know, even a representation like this, you know, obviously the the um, the artist is making a point um about oh, about a whole lot of things but but so, so you look at this and someone who saw this video said you know what's what's with that so what's going on and peterson is dead on right we don't know what's going on we don't know we don't know everything well oh, here on the back is the i just saw this i've had this on my on my wall for years you know we, we don't we don't have any idea what's going on and this is us and, and that's why you go to a therapist and you sit down and you start talking and you realize, I don't know jack about myself. And, and I've been me my whole life. What's, what's with me? And, and so then suddenly we start asking bigger questions. What are those people up to? You know, they don't know. Why did they make a pilgrimage to New York to come and look at that painting? 
It's not like they know. Why is it worth so much? I mean, I know there's a status element to it too, but that begs the question. Why do those items become such high status items? What is it about them that's so absolutely remarkable? Well, we're strange creatures. So, I was trying to figure out in part, well, where did the information that's in the dream come from? Because it has to come from somewhere, and you could think about it. And, and again, now, in, I don't know that an ancient would ask that question. But that's a function of our buffered self. That's a function of the story that we've been telling. That's a function of, well, I'm, I'm a contained being. And so the, the ways into me are through my eyes, through my ears. But, you know, lately when they've studied epigenetics and a bunch of these things, and even genetics, it's like, I, I, we, are, we are so complicated. We are such complicated creatures. But as a revelation, you know, because it's, it's like it springs out of the void and it's new knowledge and it's a revelation. You didn't produce it, it just, it just appears. And, and this is, is where at, at some point, and you know, so I've, I've got a mental list that isn't clear, it's still in the dream stage in my head, but, but in terms of what's on my to-do list about dealing with Jordan Peterson and trying to integrate what I'm learning from him into what I know, this question about representation and revelation, because revelation is, is such a hot button topic. We are so culturally and emotionally invested in our buffered self in the imminent frame. We are so invested in that. That's a boy, you start poking at that stuff. People get angry. And we're going to, we're going to talk about that as we get into some of these origin questions but that's see one of the things i want to do with this series is like i'm scientifically minded and i'm quite a rational person and i like to have an explanation for things that's rational see and so here jordan peterson now now he's laying his cards on the table which i very much appreciate because a lot of times we don't lay our cards on the table we're just we're just acting and we don't know why we're upset so so he's articulate enough and he's 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 worked himself through enough that he said, okay, these are my cards on the table. And, and when I look at things, first I'm going to deal with what I think I have an explanation for. Now it's, now it's important because when we begin to look at science, we're going to have to ask the question, well, what is science for? And then last time I talked about science versus technology because a lot of times when we're talking about science, we're, what we're really looking at is control and reproducibility. And, and that really then simply becomes a function of what I want. Uh, James K. Smith is a philosopher at Calvin College, my alma mater, and the the school of of my denomination. And you know he's been he's been mining a lot of Augustine, and he's been writing a bunch of books lately. I don't know if I have uh, one of them right down here, but but you know you you are what you love, and and you know. Peterson, when he gets into the, you know, the ape, the guy in the ape costume and, and putting the basketball around, if you've seen his other videos, you know, that that's that's just so that's just so true. We we want what we want and we see what we want and we only see what we want to see and we frame the world this way. So so then when it gets down into this question of of epistemology and knowledge and what our filters are, well, I I, I want to be in charge. I want to be in charge of my life. Neo says in The Matrix, I don't like to think I'm not in charge of my life. Well, yeah, none of us like to sit, think that. But, you know, how much is that an illusion? And empirical, before I look for any other kind of explanation. And I, I don't want to say that everything that's associated with divinity can be reduced in some manner to biology or to an evolutionary history or anything like that. But it and, and this, again, is what I really appreciate about Peterson and what really frustrates, I think, a lot of Christians who are listening to him because, again, they really want to, they really want him to make a tribal move because the idea is, well, this is just basic tribalism and we're, we're tribal creatures. I, I, we want him on our side so we can beat up the other side. Oh, okay. Um, but, but if you let your, if you let your petty war go a little bit for now, uh, and, and this is why Peterson says, you know, I'm, you, you don't box me in, in these kinds of things because you just want to use me for your own tribal wars. And I'm not really so interested in your tribal wars. I'm trying to figure this stuff out myself and I'm trying to figure out how I should live. And, and so then he, he adopts this position, which is that I'm going to, on one hand, 
look at what I can know, or at least think I know, but on the other hand, I'm not going to dogmatically reject what I know I can't know. And again, if you if you read C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the professor, you know, talks to the children about that. That's that's so C.S. Lewis. And 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 C.S. Lewis says, you know what, if if you really want to have an open mind, then have an open mind. And and what's so difficult for us as human beings is to both be secure in what we know and 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 not afraid of what we don't know so as to get reactive about it. Insofar as it's possible to do that reduction, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to leave the other phenomena floating in the air because they can't be pinned down. And, and, and in that category, I would put the category of mystical or religious experience, which we don't understand at all. So, I should have, I try to prepare this, the PowerPoint before I do this so I can get my topics in. I don't always hit everything. There was a fascinating brain book that I read a number of years ago, and, and it, it went through all of the all of the different stuff of the brain, and it was, it was fairly reductionistic, but at the end of the book, I love this image he said, you know, he said that the question is, are, are our brains computers or are they radios? Because, you know, you find a radio on the beach and, um, you know, you turn it on and you hear a signal and you think, oh, well, this, you know, here I'm getting, I'm getting something through this radio. And then you decide that, boy, you know, if I disconnect the battery, then the radio dies. But then you have the question, if you disconnect the battery on your cell phone, it's a little different than if you disconnect the battery on your radio. Well, with the internet, yes, and yes. But so, so we want to watch our reductionisms. And, and I think that's, I think that's vital in this project. Artists observe one another. They observe people and they represent what they see and they transmit the message of what they see to us and they teach us to see and we don't necessarily know what it is that we're learning from them. But we're learning something or at least we're acting like we're learning something. We go to movies, we watch stories, we, 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 we immerse ourselves in fiction constantly. That's an artistic production. And for many people, the world of the arts is a living world and that's particularly true if you're a creative person. And it's the creative, artistic people that do move the knowledge of humanity forward. And, they and, and I've been, again, reading Jung's autobiography and just impressed. You know, tremendously creative person. Um, very, very interesting, you know, unlike me in some ways. But, but part of what we can't help do is when we have an experience to generalize that onto others. So, and that's part of the reason I think Jung's work took the turn that it did. They do that with their artistic productions first. They're on the edge, and the dancers do that, and the poets do that, and the visual artists do that, and the musicians do that, and we're not sure what they're doing. Like, we're not sure what musicians are doing. What the hell are they doing? Why do you like music? You know, it gives you a deep intimation of the significance of things. And no one questions it. You go to a concert, you're thrilled. It's a quasi-religious experience, particularly if the people really get themselves together and get the crowd moving. You know, there's something incredibly intense about it, but it makes no sense whatsoever. And, you know, anybody who's followed, you know, the, the changes in church, I mean, churches have, churches have been practicing this forever. Church is, church is one of the few places in our culture where people sing, and, and, and that's being lost. There are still, you know, my tradition's a little older than a lot of, you know, non-denominational evangelicals that are around. And in many non-denominational evangelical churches, people are singing by themselves um, in, the, in, the, in the crowd. But, you know, hymn singing, for example, is, is a technology, and it's a technology that's, that's not actually not terribly old, but this, this practice of singing together, basically at a baseball game, and at a church are about the only place you're going to sing together. But that, that, that's such a powerful thing. And as Peterson is dead on right, we don't know what's going on with it, but we do it and, and we don't question it and we just do it. It's, it's not an easy thing to understand. Music is deeply patterned and, I, and, and patterned in layers. And I think that has something to do with it because re reality is patterned and deeply patterned in layers. And so I think music is representing reality in some fundamental way and that we get into the sway of that and sort of participate in being and that's part of what makes it such an uplifting experience but we don't really know that's what we're doing we just go do it and 
and, and, and it's nourishing for people, right? I mean, young people in particular, lots of them live for music. It's where they derive all their meaning, their cultural identity. And, and I, I really wonder if there's a developmental process to that. Peterson in another place, you know, makes the, basically makes the point that so much of us type onto the music that we heard when we were at a certain developmental period in our lives. And he said that, I thought, yeah, doggone it. That's, that's true. That's true. Entity, everything that's nourishing comes from their affiliation with their music and is part of their cultural identity. So that's an amazing thing. The question still remains, where does the information in dreams come from? And I think what it, the, what, where it comes from is that we watch the patterns that everyone acts out. We, we've watched that forever and we've got some representations of those patterns. That's part of our cultural history. That's what's embedded. And again, here's, here's the nut of it, that we watch these patterns and, and the, fact that, the fact that we watch them doesn't mean doesn't mean we articulate you you i have five children i watched five children grow up you 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 watch those children watch and they and they learn and, and people tell me I, I see it myself now that i'm a certain age that i can very clearly remember my father at this age and i i walk by a glass door and i cl quickly glance and i see my father no my father passed away but you know there I am. I walk like him. I sound like him. I talk like him. Some of this is genetic, but some of this is, is you know, is from being with him. And so as children, you watch. And as I, as I work with people as a pastor again and again, I see that people are like this. They, they learn from each other. They act out with each other. Again and again, you'll see children that, that when they're teenagers, they hate their parents and they grow up to be just like them. Why? They don't know why. They watch and they put this together and then they try to sort it out and they try to represent it. And added in stories, in fictional accounts of, of the story between good and evil, the bad guy and the good guy, and the romance. You know, these are these are canonical patterns of being for people and, and they deeply affect us because they represent what it is that we will act out in the world. And then we flesh that out with the individual information we have about ourselves and other people. And so it's like there's a there's a there's waves of, of behavioral patterns that manifest themselves in the crowd across time. The great dramas are played on the crowd across time. And the artists watch that and, and they get intimations of what that is and they write it down and they tell us and then we're a little clearer about what we're up to. You know, like a great dramatist like Shakespeare, let's say, is, we know that what he wrote is fiction and then we say, well, fiction isn't true. But then you think, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's true like numbers are true. You know, numbers are an abstraction from the underlying reality, but no one in their right mind would really think numbers aren't true. Now, now this is an interesting move. Fiction is true like numbers are true. I, I have to think about that longer because there's, there's something there. There's something there that I said, yeah, that's getting there. Another part of it says... I, I'm not quite sure, but fiction fiction is true like numbers are true. That's that's one of these things where you sit and you listen and you think, you know, I'm going to have to dream on that. I'm going to have to let that rumble around in the back of my head. Stuff's going to happen, and then suddenly, boom, I'm going to have an insight about that. You can even make a case that the numbers are more real than the things that they represent, right? Because the abstraction is so insanely powerful. Once you have mathematics, you're just deadly. You can move the world with mathematics. And so... It's not obvious that the abstraction is less real than the, than the, than, than the more concrete reality. And, and I remember, I remember as, a, as a young person thinking about numbers and thinking, you know, what, what, what's, you know what, what's with numbers? Am I, I mean, numbers are a frame of reference. So here, these are two books, or are they one book and one book? And so, you know, even that, the whole idea about what a number is, it, it's... You know, but again, we actually, again, if you think about Jung and his autobiography, for, I mean, for a while, he, he you know, what, what is math? What, what is this math thing that they're trying to teach me? What is this about? Now, now it's funny because sometimes very brilliant people, I don't know anything, I'm not a brain scientist, but I wonder, you know, we, we apportion our brains in different ways with different things. And, um, 
you know, some creative people who are able to make a real contribution to humanity sometimes have their brains portioned in different ways than we do. And you take a work of fiction like Hamlet and you think, well, is that, it, it's, it's not true because it's fiction. But then you think, wait a minute, what kind of explanation is that? Like maybe it's more true than nonfiction because it takes what the story that needs to be told about you and the story that needs to be told about you and you and you and you and abstracts that out and says, look, here's something that's a key part of the human experience as such, right? So it's, it's an abstraction from this underlying noisy substrate and, and people are affected by it because they see that the thing that's represented is part of the pattern of their being. That's the right way to think about it. And then with these old stories, these ancient stories, it seems to me like that process has been occurring for thousands of years. It's like we watched ourselves and we extracted out some stories. We imitated each other and we represented that in drama. And then we distilled the drama and we got a representation of the distillation. And then we did it again. And at the end of that process that took God only knows how long. Now, now right here, this is... Peterson through Jung saying, here's an evolutionary account for not just the Bible, but, but mythology. This, this is a way that we can, in a sense, without a cosmic designer, this is how we can account for the Bible and not only account for it as such that here's this book that we dreamed up, but but also account for its authority. And this is where, in a sense, um, you'll hear Peterson say in other videos that you know it took me a while to figure out. And you know, evolution is that which chooses, or evo no, that's not right. He says evolution is that which selects. And you know, now this gets into, as I mentioned before, with Alvin Plantinga, this this gets into a lot of really interesting conversations. But 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 here's the idea that that this entire process goes on generation after generation after generation. We don't even know what we're doing. We don't even know how we're doing it. But um, out of it comes these books and these stories. Now, come to think of, I didn't put this in the slides, which I should have. You know, part of my questions about this and my critique about this is when i when i look at when i look at gilgamesh you you can look at gilgamesh in a lot of mythology and and you see the dream state and this kind of pours into the mythology say yes but but when i read the bible you know the first 11 chapters are a little different in the book of genesis i'm not going to go further than that but you know once you get into the abraham story um we're we're you know, this is, we're telling a story about a regular guy. This isn't, this isn't, you know, the great king of high-walled Uruk and, you know, he and Enkidu are, are wrestling and the earth is shaking and, you know, this isn't, this isn't Homer. This is, this is a different story. And, you know, as we get into this further, we're going to, we're going to have to talk about the type of literature that the Bible is and, and the type of, the type of mythology it is, because it certainly is mythology, but when you read it, you sense it's a different kind of mythology than, say, Gilgamesh. And and what's amazing is that Gilgamesh, you know, you, you kind of lo he's kind of located around maybe 2000 BC. It's kind of the time of Abraham. So so if you if you want to compare a couple of stories and their contemporaries, read Gilgamesh, and then read Abraham, and and ask yourself. Well, what's, what feels different about these stories? What are the representations like? I think some of these stories, they, they've traced fairy tales back 10,000 years, some fairy tales, in relatively unchanged form. And, it's certain and, and even if you say compare, um, compare the biblical stories with fairy tales, th th there are certain biblical stories that, that kind of, you know, let's say, look at Jonah, um, that Jonah certainly has a fairy tale quality with the um, with the great fish that the great fish that 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 swallows him. But um, you know, compare fairy tales again with the with the kind of language that you have in the Bible. It certainly, seems to me that the archaeological evidence, for example, suggests that the really old stories that 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 the Bible begins with are at least that old and likely embedded in a prehistory that's far older than that. And you might think, well, how can you be so sure? And the answer to that in part is that cultures that don't change, like the ancient cultures, right? They didn't change as fast as this. They stay the same. That's the answer. 
So they, call, they keep their information moving generation to generation. That's how they stay the same. And so we know, again, in the archaeological record, there are records of rituals that have remained relatively unbroken for up to 20,000 years. It was discovered in caves in Japan that were set up for a particular kind of bear worship that was also characteristic of Western Europe. So these things can last for very long periods of time. We're watching each other act in the world. And then the question is, well, how long have we been watching each other? And the answer to that, in some sense, is, well, as long as there's been creatures with nervous systems. And that's a long time, you know, that's some hundreds of millions of years, perhaps longer than that. We've been watching each other, trying to figure out what we're up to across that entire span of time. And some of that knowledge is built right into our bodies, which is why we can dance with each other, for example, right? Because understanding isn't just something that you, that you have as an abstraction, it's something that you act out, you know? That's what children are doing when they're learning to rough and tumble play, is they're learning to integrate their body with the body of someone else in a harmonious way, learning to cooperate and compete, and that's all instantiated right into their body. It's not abstract knowledge. They don't and, and, and again, I mean, that's, that's, such a, that's such an important point because, you know, try and think about walking when you walk. It, this, the, the, stuff, the stuff of our bodies is built into our bodies. And uh, we, we, you know, we're in some ways, science is just kind of now getting around to figuring out some of these things. But, you know, where actually our, our knowledge is and, you know, there's some ways in which, you know, you have knowledge in the nerves in your hand. Your, your brain isn't just in your head. It's, it's distributed throughout your entire body. And so, and what's with that? And one, of the, one of the interesting things, you know, in, in, in Greek, um, you know, your bowels are are the the source of your uh, the source of your feelings and and you know that when you get stressed a lot of people there my stomach is in knots well well where did we come up with that language well we you know we experienced it in our bodies and we came up with it and now notice the kind of language my stomach is in knots that's not literal language that's you know that's a metaphor and and again when you get into Lewis and this question of representation and metaphor. Lewis, Lewis makes the point that, well, people say, well, I don't, I just can't imagine that God is an old man in the sky who sits on a throne. Um, I think God is more like a force. And Lewis makes the point that, well, you've just swapped one metaphor for another. You know, one metaphor, an old man in the sky sitting on the throne. There's a metaphor of an image of a father. But I think God is more of a force or an energy. Well, now you've just kind of swapped anthropology for physics because a force is, you know, you're still doing the same thing, whether you're talking about an old man in the sky or a force or an energy or a gas or, or what have you. In fact, when we talk about spiritual, we talk about ethereal. We're talking about ether. And we, we cannot help but use this kind of language if we're trying to articulate that which... We're not really, that which we can't control. They don't know that they're doing that. They're just doing it. And so we can even use our body as a representational platform. So we've been studying each other for a long time, abstracting out what is it that we're up to. And that's, that, that's what is it we're up to? What should we be up to? That's even a more fundamental question. If you're going to live in the world and you're going to do it properly, and, and even if you read, for example, C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain, you know, once you make this move to should, everything changes. Everything changes. You cannot make that move to should. On what basis do you make this move to should? And, and, and can you account for that? Well, maybe, you know, you feel it back here among the, the, the hosts of beings inside you. But we, we, we use it all the time. We can't help. Our entire civilization is built on should. And then you read some of the, again, some of the more contemporary brain books. And, you know, well, you know, there's, we're Dostoevsky. We're keys on a piano. And, and we really shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't use should. And I look at this and I say, you can't not use should. You, you simply cannot live in this world without it. What does properly mean and how is it that you might go about that? Well, it, it's the right question, right? It's what everyone wants to know. How do you live in the world? Not what is the world made of. It's not the same question. How do you live in the world? 
And, and that point right there, it's not what the world's made of. It's how you live in a world. A little bit later, I'm going to point to John Walton because that's exactly the point he makes when he looks in the lost world of Genesis 1. That the lost world of Genesis 1, his, his whole point is that, that the story of Genesis 1 is a temple. It's basically a temple text. And, and hopefully as we get into, uh, I'll often, I'll often say something, tell people about Genesis 2 that's, that didn't occur to me until only about a year ago of, of that's I think any ancient person would have seen right away the most alarming thing about Genesis 2 and 3 is in the garden is that there is no altar well why is there no altar well if you can understand the question of why there is no altar in the garden you can begin to understand the representation of the world that that entire story assumes and and so you know this the, the the ancients i mean you can you can just assume stuff what they want to know is should and can and and ought and do it's the eternal question of human beings and i guess we're the only species that has ever really asked that question because all the other animals they just go and do whatever they do no. and again that's dead right take your dog look at your dog your dog doesn't ask ought now, now I think we project odd on our dog. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't any um, tiny little moral functioning going in the going on in the brain of your tiny little dog, but um, we are the we are the only creatures involved in this. What does that say? And, and and we quite frankly can't help ourselves. We don't even know what we're doing when we're doing it. Not us. It's a question for us. We've had to. We have to become aware of it. We have to be able to speak it. God only knows why, but that seems to be the situation. So, we act, that acting is shaped by the world, that acting is shaped by society into something that we don't understand, but that we can model, that we can model. We model it in our stories, we model it with our bodies. And that's where the dream gets its information. The dream is part of the process that's watching everything. So, so here, Peterson, basically makes an imminent frame move and that's where we get our information the difficult the difficult thing is that we definitely get our information from there um, we, we definitely watch each other and get our information and our our brains are sponges and we're picking this up and we don't even know we're picking this up but but we can't say we're not getting our information from someplace else if someplace else exists when when CS Lewis begins um, his book on miracles, he, he begins by talking about naturalism. And, and he says, you know, part of the first difficulty of defining naturalism is to say, well, well, what is it? Well, what are we? Well, what is there? Is, is this within the imminent frame? Is this the whole show? Well, the difficulty that we have is that we, you know, especially with, with our scientific tools, those tools frame an existence, and we're going to talk about that in a, in a little bit while in this in this video. These tools frame our existence, and and what's lovely about a frame is that's a really helpful thing because, you know, it's a sandbox, and you can say, okay, we're going to deal with everything in the sandbox. And Peterson is right to say, well, well, let me just deal with what's in the sandbox. The difficult thing we know is, we can't. It, it's terribly hard to know what you don't know, which is exactly why Sam Harris makes the observation about the evil eye. Okay, well. Well, you know, if my neighbor is giving me the stink eye, I, I, I don't really worry that they're, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're putting a hex on me. That's that's sim That's not my culture. That's not my frame. But, you know, are they are they doing something else malicious? What are they plotting? What are what other things are they doing? Just just because you have a sandbox doesn't mean you know what's outside the sandbox, and that's always the problem. Now, if you can say, well, we can account for everything, and and this is exactly where you have a problem because it's very difficult to account for what you you know by definition you can't account for because you don't know it. You it's hard to prove an unknown. And then trying to formulate it and trying to say, well trying to get the signal out from the noise and to portray it in dramatic form because a dream is a little drama and then you get the chance to talk about what that dream is and then you have it you have something like articulated knowledge at that point and so the bible i would say is is it's sort of it exists in that space that's half into the dream and half into articulated knowledge 
and and that's again you have to understand what he means by dream um and and i think again story it's well i in some ways it's a simpler way to say that is the bible is a story but but you have to understand what a story is and and understand you have to understand what a story is and and that's not a simple thing it's something like that and going into it to find out what the stories are about can what can what it can aid our self understanding and then the other issue is is that if nietzsche was correct and if dostoevsky or jung was correct and dostoevsky as well we, without the cornerstone that that understanding provides we're lost and that's not good because then we're susceptible to psychic pathology that's psychological pathology and and this gets into this gets into my point about the the art gallery that your your experience of the art you know this you know some of the some of the some of the cats in this picture i don't mean cats i mean you know people um some of the people in this picture i i have ideas about them and and so the artist makes a representation well i'm when i'm doing this i'm engaging in this conversation and what's scary and what what jung and freud I'm engaging in this conversation in ways I don't even know. And and the way I know about it is probably more telling about the way I feel. Now, at some point we're going to have to talk about feelings because you you have to you have to really wrestle with what feelings are. And th this is this is where when it when it comes to questions of religion and I know some of you out there because you've written to me some of you out there are dealing with questions, you know, I, I don't know what to feel about religion. I, and we're, we're going to get into that further. You know, I, you know, re religion is a bunch of stories. Okay. Well, everything's a bunch of story. You cannot escape story. Um, we have feelings about it. And maybe you grew up in a church where someone said, well, I just feel that God is telling me, oh, okay. They feel that way. And, and if you listen to Jung, well, that makes perfect sense that this, this, this unknown inside feels like God or the Holy Spirit. And again, I'm not going to be reductionistic and say it isn't, but even within the Christian tradition, there, there are compensations for this within the tradition that says, okay, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We're going to hold that in evaluation. And, and in fact, you know, one of the, in Deuteronomy 18, there's the test of a prophet. And, and the test of a prophet is this. If what the prophet says comes true, then they're a true prophet. And if what the test of the prophet, and, and if what the prophet says is false, they're a false prophet and you should kill them. Um, now that'll put some restrictions on prophecy, at least in the near term. And, um, but, but even in the, even in the Old Testament, the, the questions of who would, of which prophets would be in the canon had a great deal to do with whether, in a sense, their prophecy was verified, if they could predict. And, and we do the same thing today. I think it was, what was the 2008 election, Nate Silver predicted that Barack Obama would win. And so, I don't know, 2008 or maybe it was 2012, I don't remember. One of the elections, Nate Silver, um, uh, 3850, is that it? He, he was He's doing sports things, and then he did the elections. And then so we get into the election in 2016. You've got Trump and Hillary and Nate Silver's like, you know, Hillary's, you know, 70% chance of winning, blah, 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 blah. He gets it wrong. Uh, suddenly Nate Silver's stock in the culture goes whoosh. And and then you find the, the, the few odd predictors who said that Trump would win. And now, mark my words, 2020, everyone's going to beat a path to their door. And, and that's where, in a sense, you get into this evolutionary dynamic. You know, the people who are ad adamant, anti-religious thinkers seem to believe that if we abandoned our immersement in the underlying dream that we'd all instantly become rationalists like Descartes or Bacon or, you know, intelligent, clear-thinking, rational, scientific people. And I don't believe that for a moment because I don't think there's any evidence for it. I think... And then you've got G.K. Chesterton, probably apocryphal quote, that that someone who stops believing in something will will not believe in nothing they'll they'll likely believe in anything and because in a sense in a sense what you lose is your filter and and so you know to 
you know, to try to be fair to the materialists, uh, at least they have a filter and, and they're working their filter. And, and what you find with a materialist is that every filter has strengths and weaknesses. And, and the strength of the materialist filter is that people come along and say, well, I thank God you just shut them down right away. And, and there's, there's something good to be said about that. At the same time, the materialist filter falls with the first miracle. Now, you've got the amazing Randy out there and, you know, I don't think he's doing it anymore, but he had his million dollar challenge. If someone can, if someone can find me a bona fide miracle, you know, I'll, I'll give them a million dollars. Um, but, but it's, it's not how we work. But, but, but there again, we all have, we all have our filters. I think we would become so irrational so rapidly that the weirdest mysteries of Catholicism would seem positively rational by contrast. And I think that's already happening. So. And here, the applause for that line, again, expresses something that's obviously, it's in the crowd, it's in many people in the crowd, it's in many people who are following Peterson. Why are they following Peterson? Because people have a sneaking suspicion that the project that we've been working on, and some of the forks that have made, they're looking down the road, and, and they don't know why, but, but they just have a gut feeling like, this is a bad idea, and and I don't know why it's a bad idea, but I think it's a bad idea. And then you know, a post hoc they might make up a story that says why it's a bad idea. And then, if you're cynical, you say, well, all of this is a post hoc story to say why it's a bad idea. But then you have to ask the question, well, how do you tell a good idea from a bad idea? And and now we're back into conversation. Okay. So this is the idea, essentially, you know, that you have the unknown world. That, that's just what you don't know at all. That's, that's the outside. That's the ocean that surrounds the island that you inhabit, something like that. It's chaos itself. And then you act in that world, and you act in ways you don't understand. There's more to your actions than you can understand. One of the things Jung said, I loved this when I first understood it. He said, everybody acts out a myth, but very few people know what their myth is. And you should know what your myth is because it might be a tragedy and maybe you don't want it to be. And that's really worth thinking because thinking about because you're, you have a pattern of behavior that characterizes you, you know, and God. It might be a tragedy and maybe you don't want that. Okay, now we're getting back to Augustine. Now, if, if there's someone in the ancient world you want to read who's really interesting, Augustine. Um... There's, there's a great, great courses, um, there's a great, great courses um, series on Augustine's City of God. Incredible book. In, in some ways, crazy book. Foundational book. Brilliant book. Um, but, and, and one of the things I love about Peterson is he's, he's quite forthright with the fact that, that we, have, we have treasures, we have treasures that we're simply ignoring. And None of us is well-educated enough or well-read enough to, to, to actually deal with any of this, which, again, is why free speech is so important, because free speech must always be paired with humility, because people need to be free to speak, but no one will listen if, if we're just all reactive. God only knows where you got it. Partly it's biological, partly it's from your parents, it's, it's your unconscious assumptions, it's the way the philosophy of your society has shaped you, and it's, it's aimed, it's aiming you somewhere. Well, is it aiming you somewhere you want to go? That's a good question. That's part of self-realization, you know. We know we don't understand our actions. That's almost every argument you have with someone is about that. It's like, well, why did you do that? And you come up with some half-baked reasons why you did it. You're flailing around in the darkness, you know. And what you really need for this is to be married because suddenly your spouse says, well, well, why did you do that? And you realize, I don't know why I did it. I just did it. And you might be in trouble for it, but there you are. Well, you try to give an account for yourself, but you can only do it partially. It's very, very difficult because... You're, in, you're, you're a complicated animal with the, the beginnings of an articulated mind, something like that. And you're just way more than you can handle. And, and That's a great line. 
you're way more than you can handle. And and you see this if you raise small children because you have this you have this little toddler and the toddler and you realize the toddler hasn't had their nap and and pretty soon they they can't handle themselves. All they do is cry. Goes, ah, I can't handle myself. Okay, what you need is a nap and a bottle and you'll go to bed and you'll be okay. And in the morning they can handle themselves again. All right, so you act things out, right? You you act things out. And this this I think is a is a really helpful representation. What I didn't get when I first saw it was he says it, but I would have liked him, and maybe I'll doctor it at some point. I mean, it's surrounded by chaos. This is the island, and chaos is this is this world that's so complex that that we can't possibly engage. And so then we simplify. And again, in his maps of meaning, you have these these brackets, and I thought that was a tremendously helpful idea. So so, but but kind of the process here is oh he'll he'll walk through it. And that's a kind of competence. And then you imagine what you act out, and you imagine what everyone else acts out. And so there's a tremendous amount of information in your action. And then that information is translated up into the dream and into art, into mythology and literature. And there's a tremendous amount of information in that. And then some of that is translated into articulated. That, that, that's right. And this is, you know, so so there's there's this there's this chaos and then we're watching and then this gets into the dream phase and and his point is that there's a tremendous amount of information in that dream phase there's there's more there's more information i can talk pictures worth a thousand words i can talk about this picture a long time and not um and, and not basically not exhaust it that's the right word and not exhaust it so you know that there, there's more there's more in the dream phase that I can articulate and we have that experience all the time I, I have a thought I have that experience when I'm making these videos I have a thought and I'm trying to get it into words because if I get it into words I can hopefully connect with you and that then gets in and this is what it means to be a human being thought and I'll give you a quick example of something like that I think this is partly what happens in Exodus when Moses comes up with Okay, and that's where he that's where he's going in terms of the Bible, and I want to stop there because um, that'll be for another lecture when we actually get into the biblical material. Now, now one of the questions is why are some religious skeptics, atheists, agnostics listening to Peterson about the Bible? And I think this is a big part of it that that Peterson is articulating an origin story for the Bible that's within their atheistic worldview. And it's within their evolutionary worldview uh, that that's that's better said the second way, and and the reason for this is because for the last over 150 years we've had a culture war that has weaponized the creation science debate in a very low resolution and. It's always hard to talk about hot button issues because we we are naturally reactive to what we've been formed to react to. In, in some Christian churches, Darwin is a snake, to put it in Jordan Peterson terms. That is not true of all Christian churches by any means. And I want, I want us to be able to talk to both groups. And so if you look at my big five trait personalities, I am, I am, I am high in openness and, and, but I'm also the product of a, a conservative, a conservative Christian tradition. And so here, you know, this is, this is kind of how I've been put together, but we've had polarization in our culture and in, I mentioned a couple of videos ago, I, I think are the culture war we're dealing with right now is a culture war of Christendom. And, and part of what Jordan Peterson, part of why Jordan Peterson is significant is because, in a sense, he's, he's bringing these two pieces together. On one sense, nobody's going to question his, his credentials as a Darwinian. On the other hand, he's also saying, being via Jung, I, I'm, I'm not ready to throw away the Bible and dismiss it as, as readily or, or, or cast a moral judgment on it as, as quickly as, let's say, someone like Sam Harris. And I think part of that is because of the history that we've had of, of weaponizing the creation science debate. And, and in all fairness, that happens on both sides because so often when, you know, you have a, 
okay, young person grows up in a in a in a church and where they learn Darwin is evil and we've got to stay away from we've got to stay away from evolution. And so they they put that in and then they go to secular university and oh my goodness, these professors aren't evil and they're teaching me all this stuff and well, everything in my church was wrong. Well, probably not everything, but um and then suddenly they're flipping the other way and it's like whoa let's 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 tone down the flipping here okay and and let's talk about about people and and these kinds of ideas uh the metaphysical club was a book that peterson mentions in in some of his classes and uh fascinating book part of part of what's really nice about that book and and reading history in general is that Culturally, we pick up, especially in our weaponized culture, we pick up these low-resolution impressions of history. And, and if you actually read history, you will discover that a lot of these low-resolution pictures are distortions. Now, you need low-resolution pictures just because the world is so complex. And so I'm not saying that there's something wrong with low-resolution, but the difficulty with low resolution is that it isn't just low resolution and history is always way more complex often than the little weaponized stories that were wielding in the culture war so so menon begins by talking about the origin of the species was published on november 24 1859 the word evolution barely appears in it that's um you know that's that's like when i mentioned you know grab a bible concordance and look for the word religion in the bible I think it's in most English translations, found maybe two, three times. You say, what do you mean the word religion isn't in the Bible? Well, it isn't. Um, evolution is barely in the origin of the species. Many scientists in 1859 were evolutionists. Darwin didn't come up with evolution. Um, that is, they believed that species had not been created once and for all, but they changed over time. And, and if you had a decent education in biology, you know that there are different types of evolution. French nationalist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck had advanced his theory of progressive adaptation. By 1809, the English philosopher Herbert Spencer had published his evolutionary theory of mind and behavior. In 1855, Darwin's book, Precise, the Darwin's book decisively tipped the balance of educated opinion to evolutionism, but even in 1859, more 19th century evolutionists were, whether they identified themselves or not, Lamarckian or Spencerian than Darwinian. The purpose of On the Origin of Species was not to introduce the concept of evolution that was already there, and, and many of the people that embraced evolution were Christians. Um, the and, and again we're always when we deal with these labels we always have the difficulty of labels I just want to put that disclaimer out there the purpose of on the origin of species was not to introduce the concept of evolution it was to debunk the concept of supernatural intelligence now again this is interesting because on one hand the low resolution anti-darwinists their low resolution picture was correct. Darwin was saying something, at least according to, to this book, Darwin was, because getting back into people's motivations is always a dangerous thing because, you know, it's, it's really hard to know somebody else's motivation because it's often really hard to know my own motivation. The idea that the universe is the result of an idea. That, that there isn't a mind who mapped this out and designed and created it. And this is where you get into the whole contemporary arguments about intelligent design. For a belief that species evolved is not incompatible with a belief in divine creation or a belief in intelligent design. And in fact, today, and I'll get into that, there's plenty of Christians who believe in um, people who on one hand say, well, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. On the other hand, they say, I believe that there was an evolutionary process that resulted in humanity, and that theory is, for the most part, correct. Biologos.org, um, Calvin College, my alma mater has had a hand in that. The difficulty, though, of being in the middle is it's just easier to be on one side or the other because you just wall off that whole thing, and in fact, you create a low-resolution image that you can walk around with. It's just easier to deal with. And, and then, you know, you've just, dis, you've just, dis, you've described your camp and you can say yes or no on things. Well, that's, there's no, there are very few things as low resolution as yes and no. For belief that species evolved is not incompatible with a belief in divine creation or belief in intelligent design. Progressive adaptation might simply be the mechanism God had selected to, to realize his intentions. 
What was radical about On the Origin of Species was not its evolutionism, but its materialism. Darwin wanted to establish something even his most loyal disciples were reluctant to admit. Now here you've got some sociology of knowledge issues, no doubt, impacting people's science. Scientists are always people, and they've always got this. Peterson says at this one point, it's really hard for us to think scientifically. It's really hard for scientists to think scientifically. And this is behind a lot of the, the fight that he and Jonathan Haidt are fighting right now. Darwin wanted to establish something even his most loyal disciples were reluctant to admit, which is that the species, including human beings, were created by, and even you can't, are you going to get rid of that word? I, this is really hard because... We, we, we inhabit language as well. We're created by and evolve according to processes that are entirely natural. Again, this word natural is a big word too, something you really have to deal with. Chance generated, oh boy, if you're a Calvinist, you're really going to have issues with that word. And blind, blind? What does blind mean? Well, again, blind is a metaphor. Now, I'm, not, I'm not debunking this, I'm just saying... This is complicated. And, and, and even when we talk about it with a fairly high degree of specificity, because I think these are, you know, terrifically apt, well-chosen words to describe this, we can't help do it without a story. In order to do this, he had to do more than, he had to do more than come up with a new set of scientific arguments. He had to develop what amounted to a new way of thinking. And this, this I think was what really opened my eyes when I read this passage of the book. Darwin regretted that the word selection suggested an intention. Again, Darwin stuck with the English language. Natural selection is a blind process. Again, another metaphor. Because the conditions to which the organism must adapt in order to survive are never the same. In periods of drought, when seeds are hard to find, finches that happen to have long, narrow beaks, good for foraging, will be favored over finches with broad, powerful beaks. More of their offspring will survive and reproduce. In periods of abundance, when seeds are large and their shells are hard, the broad-beaked finches will hold the adapt adaptive advantage and this is the key idea that um, that the book goes into which which again as you listen to it if you try and get your mind around it is like this is this is straining my categories finchness is variable not a constant so what is finchness and and, and we're just talking about little birds here so so yeah this is tough recent book that came out by Tim Stafford and nobody's got, you know, evangelical is, is I think, more a market and political term than actually a religious term. That's my own bias. I'll, I'll, lay, I'll lay that card down. Uh, Tim Stafford has better evangelical credentials than just about anyone. Former editor of Christianity Today, um, uh, son of the Presbyterian Church. And, and he, in this book, he, he, writes about his, he writes about his son. And, and his son, who, you know, got into science and, and his, his belief in science shook his Christian faith. And maybe like, again, many of you who are listening brought him to the point of saying, I can't believe in Christianity because this other vision of the world is so compelling. And, and, and that gets into, that gets into Jung and his autobiography saying, you know, I, I can't, I can't read a book with miracles. And it gets into Thomas Jefferson's Bible where he tries to keep all the moral ideas and get rid of all the ideas that imagine the supernatural. And that, of course, gets into my last video where I talk about, well, well, then we embrace the morality of Christianity, but now we're in a process where we're discarding that. So, so the values, but again, back to Stafford. So Stafford writes about his son. There are probably other factors in their drift, but the clash between science and the Bible was certainly a big part of the struggle. Silas, that's his son, fell out, fell out with the whole circle. Years later at a camp reunion, he had a warm encounter. This was a Bible camp that he went to, but then by, by then the damage was done. They weren't going to pick up the friendship that they left off years before because they're, they're polarized. They're another camp. This was the first time I experienced firsthand the damage that can be done when science and faith are at odds. It hurt my son in an area of deep importance, and I felt it. 
I grew up a devout Bible-believing Christian home where questions about human origins were only occasionally discussed. My parents were open to the possibility that Noah's flood was local, not universal, and that the six days of creation might refer to long periods of time, but they believed that the Creator God, not random or directionless process, okay, back to Darwin, and that question was the center of the story. We have to tell this as a story. We have to tell this as a story. They sense that evolution could eliminate God from that story, a possibility they would never accept. Now, what's fun about Stafford's book is there are a lot of books out there that deal with this question of science and the Bible. What's fun about Stafford's book is he starts the book with some biographies of creation scientists. And I love why he started with that, not in terms of weapon, not in terms of a weapon in the culture war, but, but he tells those stories that someone who is a Christian and believes in evolution, and he tells those stories basically to illustrate that these creation scientists, well, they may be, in your opinion, wrong about some things, but they're not three-headed monsters. And, and, and some of them are actually very good scientists. They're just trying to prove something really hard, and it's it may especially be really hard if, if they're really wrong. But, but this is actually how science works. In a little while, I'm going to bring up um, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolution. I read that book in college, and, and it just transformed it you know brought my low resolution assumption about science that science is this progressivist this progressivistic march of accumulating more and more information into the fact that science also has sociology well what does that mean well what is going back to Brett Weinstein what is the top level story well i think science is the top level story and i say science has sociology it can't be the top level story because people are doing it and that's why it's really hard to be a scientist so and and this then gets me back to to soul searching and christian smith's book because you know here we have all these americans who are you know well we're kind of relativistic and we have some ideas about cultural relativism and and this drips into people's religion but we say, yeah, you know, if you grew up in a Muslim country, you'll bother, you'll probably be Muslim. Well, if you grew up in a in in a in a creation science group, you'll probably be creation science. And if you grew up in a in an evolution group, you'll probably lean that way. And then sometimes people flop camps, and then they, they become pariahs in the culture war because everyone really hates a traitor more than someone who's on the other side. And so th this is this is sociology we're working on here. And and now as a Christian, well, what are my values? Well, what is Jesus? I, I, I remind my congregation many times that I believe Christ, in Christianity, loving your enemy is not something we reserve for advanced Christianity. Loving your enemy is basic to the entire project. Why? Well, according to the Christian story, because we made ourselves God's enemies, and God has been trying to reach across the divide. And obviously through Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian minister. This is this is what I do. Well, maybe you believe that, maybe you don't. Maybe you believe his, Jesus was historical, maybe you don't. You know, you're going to believe what you're going to believe. I can't stop you. But um, Christians ought to be able to understand relativism. It's, you know, and, and cultural relativism. It doesn't mean you necessarily cave to it, but it's, it's 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 what we think and it doesn't necessarily mean it, it's just again one piece in this tremendously complicated world I, I mentioned before i was a missionary in the dominican republic and the guy over in the the blue shirt and the tie playing the guitar his name was fanel innocente and um as you can tell his last name is innocent and he was a school teacher and he was a school teacher because he's one of the better educated um, individuals in that Haitian community living in the Dominican Republic amongst people that are cutting sugar cane and picking coffee. And I needed a, I needed a, a translator because I was, 
I had learned Spanish to live in the Dominican Republic, but I was working mostly with Haitians, and I had to engage Haitians who were living way back in the sticks, and most of them only spoke Creole, so we would do our services in Spanish and Creole. I would spoke, speak Spanish, and Fennel would translate into Creole, and so we would travel, we'd spend hours driving up and down the coast of Hispaniola, and we'd have plenty of time, and one day he says to me, I wonder what it is where the, where the sky meets the ocean. And I thought, what do you mean? Well, well, I wonder what that's like where the sky meets the ocean. I thought, huh. Then one day he says to me, because he knows I was, you know, I was going back to the States for, for a couple of months. He says, are you going to drive back? Are you taking your car with you? And I thought, huh. Um, the idea that the earth is a globe and not flat. And, and the idea that you live on an island. And I can't drive to Nueva York because many Dominicans had a very low resolution picture of the United States, Nueva York. I can't drive to Nueva York? Well, what am I supposed to think of for now? Well, you might think, well, he's a school teacher. Is he propagating flat earth ideas? He probably wasn't talking about it at all. And in fact, if you've, if you've, if you've, worked with enough of a diversity of people. If I'd brought a globe into the into the classroom, I'd said, here's a globe. Everyone ought to believe in this globe. Just because of the culture dynamics, Fennell would probably say, oh, yes, absolutely, I do. And, and if I were to sit down and try and demonstrate, okay, the earth is, is round, not flat, and, and the Greeks figured this out, you know, you know, way, way before Columbus. In fact, Columbus thought the earth was more pear-shaped. But again, that's higher resolution than most people know. Sometimes I go into classrooms and I'm asked to give talks and things. And one of the little exercises I'll do with students, I say, how many of you think the world is flat? Nobody. I say, how many of you can demonstrate to me that the world is round? And they say, well, there's that picture from the moon. Okay, don't use a picture. Demonstrate to me in another way why, how the world is round. And, and then I talk to them about the horizon and the ship coming up and this kind of thing. And, you know, how the, how the Greeks figured it out through math. But nobody in the classroom knew. They all believe the earth was round. Why? Authority. They believe it because someone told them that. And in fact, they are so vested in this conception that if I were to, if I somehow had great social authority, or maybe we had a totalitarian regime that insisted that the earth was flat, um, you know, you might get them to say, oh yeah, I believe that way. But this is not how belief works in people. It's not that simple. So how do people form their beliefs? Um, usually authority. Authority flows from trust. You believe what your, if your parents were good, if they were kind, if they fed you, if they didn't beat you, if, if they were loving, if, if generally speaking they treated you well, they weren't perfect, but they were, you know, above average, um, and they told you stuff you believed them. And in fact, if you look at soul, see, soul searching, most of the kids, when asked, where do you get your beliefs from? From my parents. Why? I think my parents were right. Well, good for you. Of course you think your parents are right. You should. That's, that's what it means to have parents. So authority flows from trust and a reputation for competence. Um, I saw my, my dad could do a lot of things, and so I trust him when he taught me this. But for the most part, the, the relational locator value of the origin story is more relevant to practice than to physics. Now, I wrote this just a few hours ago, and I can't for the life of me remember what it, the point I was making. How do people form their beliefs? Well, it, it's all within, um, okay, what we're dealing with here are origin stories. And, and where, who tells you that origin story is of, is, and what that origin story means for your entire world is more important to you than what it means in the external world. For example, Fennell thought the world was flat. Well, in terms of, for Fennell's needs, he will likely, he will never leave that island his whole life long. He doesn't have the right passport to do it. Um, for, for what his world needed, his flat earth worked fine. And, and this is where you get into pragmatism. And, and he developed his belief because of the, the relational stuff. I often think about, I often think about people who have particular low resolution ideas about the world. You go to the gas pump and you fill up your car with petroleum that was found 
founded upon models of geology that they might not subscribe to. Um, it doesn't matter. Does, should I have made it my mission in the Dominican Republic to try to convince Fennell that the world was round? Could I? I doubt it. I, I have friends who used to believe the world is round, but now for, for relational, conceptual reasons of their own, they've flipped and gone to become flat earth. And, and I read when I don't know a lot of these people, but again, I'm a pastor. I like mixing it up with lots of different kinds of people. And when someone comes to me and confesses to me, and usually because, you know, I'm a pastor, people will tell pastors things they won't tell anybody else. And they tell me, I believe in a flat earth. And I believe in a flat earth because that helps my biblical world make more sense. I understand that, and hopefully in later videos I'll get into some of these representations and how to navigate some of these questions, which is probably the reason I'm, I'm you know, working through Jordan Peterson. But, so, so you, you, you follow the chain of being, and let's say you've got a person who um, believed in evolution and believed that the world was round and believed that science was all there is, you know, Nacho Libre, it was Escaletto, I only believe in science. Um, and, and they, they went down that path and they were suicidal and miserable and self-destructive and, and had no, and had no restraint on any of their appetites. And then they get into a 12 step program in a church and they have a religious conversion. And now suddenly because of the religious conversion, they're sober, they're married, they can hold a job. And, and this all trait goes down to the Bible, but these cross pressures in the culture that says, you know, I, I don't know how to not read the Bible literalistically and stay sober. Now, now, I know as a culture, we want to come to those people and say, oh, you're committing a thought crime and you must convert the other way. Or, and they, they might say, well, if I convert that way, I'll die. And what do you mean you'll die? I'll drink myself to death, or I'll I'll do drugs until I die. And and again, as a pastor, this is the world that I'm living in. And maybe because Peterson worked so long in um in some of these other in some of these other realms, this is this is why he sees it too. And so if someone tells me I must believe in a literal Bible, or I'll drink myself to death, I will say, believe in your literal Bible. Go ahead because I want to see you alive. Call me a prag pragmatist. Call me, you know, say I'm compromising. But for that exchange, I'll take that exchange with a person that I, that I know and love. So, so here we're at, we're at Peterson via Jung, where, where the Bible comes from. And this is sources of self that the, that the Bible over time, over process, this evolutionary process makes its way up out of, out of the dream world. And, and the Bible is, as Peterson says, kind of half in the dream world. And then again, did you see what I just did? Did you see what Peterson did when he's talking about this? Why did I put my hands like he did it? I didn't plan on doing this. I, I did it because I saw him do it. And and my mind, my unconscious mind, my subconscious mind heard him do it. And I'm listening to his words. And here at the age of 54, I'm still mapping on someone. What have I never grown up? But 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 this is what we do. And see, now I've completely forgotten the point. But But the Bible is in this, another word that we could use, the Bible is in this liminal space. And, and, and this is, you know, people will sometimes say to me, well, 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 what's with the Bible? And I'd say, well, it is the most, well, it's not on the New York Times bestseller list. That's why they take it off. Because every year it would be the most popular book in the world. And, and every year it's, a, it's in more translations than any other book. And, and people are writing about it. It's the most studied book in all of human history. You say, well, I've got doubts about it. I, one of my professors at seminary was on the, the NIV translation team. And he said to us, he said, you know, people often come up to me and say, well, this verse here, I don't think you got it right. And he, he says, you know, you don't understand how these modern contemporary translations arrive. There's a committee that does this. I've got thousands of examples where I differ with the committee in terms of the translation. We pour over this book. And, and, and I think as Peterson said, this is the foundation for our civilization. And just, 
if you want to be a well-educated person, you're going to have to know the stories. Or you're actually, when you walk into that museum in New York City, you're not going to have any idea of the conversation that makes any of those pictures relevant. Now, now what's what's interesting is that I, you know, I try to read broadly. Um, and Happiness Hypothesis, I thought, was a, a, a book I really enjoy. Robert Dunbar has demonstrated that within a given group of vertebrate species, primates, carnivores, ungulates, birds, reptiles, or fish, the logarithm of brain size is almost perfectly proportional to the logarithm of social group size. In other words, all over the animal kingdom, brains grow to manage larger and larger groups. Social animals are smart animals. Now, what we're getting in to here is an origin story. And, and so sometimes when I look at these origin stories, well, let, let me back up. So, so what Jung gives us and what Peterson gives us through Jung is an origin story. Now, if you're a Christian listening to this, you might say, well, how the heck do you know any of this? My origin story says that God inspired the minds of these writers, not just the writers, but the committees and the redactors and the editors, and shaped this book. That's, that's the origin story. Now, now, what's interesting about the Christian origin story, let's, let's look at, for example, the first five books, the first five books of Moses. And Christian tradition says that, you know, Moses had a hand in writing this down, and that could very well be. But Almost nobody argues that Moses had a hand in writing those books down and giving to them to us as is, especially given at the end of the book of Deuteronomy where Moses is writing about his own death. No, almost everyone agrees that, that there's some redaction that, that, that was possible. But then you ask the question, well, how did Moses get the stories of Adam and Eve and Abraham and Joseph and Jacob, how did Moses get those stories? And and what's interesting is often I find that Christians kind of revert into mechanical inspiration, not organic. I talked about this in the last video. Revert into mechanical inspiration and say, God, God what? God dictated it to him? Uh, for the most part, you know, my tradition doesn't doesn't embrace the dictation theory. And, and the organic theory is that God moves somehow to, to organize these stories. And so here we have two competing origin stories for the Bible. And, and again, what I get frustrated with, well, for some, sometimes frustrated again, I'm, I'm high in openness, but I'm raised and continue to inhabit a conservative religious tradition. And, and so I'll read this and, and sometimes I'll think, well, how do you know? Well, well, okay, there's a correlation between brain size and social group size, and what hate continues to do is, is give us, in a sense, an origin story. Human beings ought to live in a group of about 150 people. Now, if you study church stuff, one of the things you know that most congregations are about that size, and, and people can kind of manage between 150 and 200 people, and if you have a church with one pastor, it's usually about that size, because relationally, that's about what the group can hold together. It's very interesting that you have this size and... Anyway, judging from the logarithm of our brain size, and sure enough, studies of hunter-gatherer groups, military units, and churches, city dwellers, address books suggested that 100 to 150 is the natural group size with which people can know just about everyone by name and face and know how each person is related to everyone else. Dunbar suggests that language evolved as a replacement for physical grooming. Oh, well, could be. I, I don't know who, you know. But how do you know? There's an origin story. So, so now people say, well, I can't believe the Bible because they've got these origin stories. What we're doing, and this is, this is what struck me when I was watching Peterson's video, what we're doing here is, is exactly what Peterson says. We've, we've got these ideas, and, and, and Haight is doing it, and Dunbar is doing it, and Peterson is doing it, and Jung is doing it. It's all the same process. We're, we're, we're taking this stuff and saying, oh, we've got brain size over here, you know, primates groomed, and you can only groom so many people in the day, and if you watch them, they spend a lot of time grooming. Language evolves, so, you know, I don't have to touch old Aunt Sadie because, you know, I don't want to, or I don't have to touch young, um, you know, young person here because someone might, you know, say, well, pastor shouldn't touch them. I can just talk to them with language. Well, and, and did, is that how language evolved? Well, I don't know. 
but that's an origin story. And so the evolution of the origin story um, is, is what we're seeing here. So now, so then you have these low resolution stories and they're representations. Story A, you have six days, Adam and Eve, tree, snake, exile. Story B, you have the singularity, big bang, expanding universes, creation of heavy matter, cooling, gravity, water, volcanism, ocean vents, boom, on we go. Um, these are all fairly low resolution stories. These are all origin stories. Now, one of the things that, one of the things that, um, that I mentioned earlier is that all of these stories are representations nested within their own cultural framework. John Walton recently has been doing some writing. John Walton is an Old Testament scholar, taught for a long time at Wheaton College, which again, this is, these, are, these are conservative religious people. And he's writing these books and he's making a point similar to Peterson that, you know, when you read Genesis 1, God is setting up a functional universe. Take a look at the word create. Now, now, we tend to bend towards the material, and you might say, well, why do we bend towards the material? Well, this is where the materialists and the fundamentalists have a lot in common, where the materialists and the fundamentalists are both past the Protestant Reformation, past attempting to ground, um, ground a common knowledge in a certain way, past Nietzsche, and they've got all of that stuff in their mind, and what that means is that the materialists and the fundamentalists have more in common with each other than they do with Fennel, or they do with people in the Middle East, or they do with people in other cultures. And, and so, well, if you know anything about sociology of conflicts, it's people who are close together that fight. In the Dominican Republic, um, I'd often see that North Americans could more easily come and work with Dominicans than people from Puerto Rico. And you'd say, well, people from Puerto Rico, that should be easier because they share a common language, they share, share a common trait. Yeah, but they're too close. And so conflicts tend to spark up. Uh, hate, Americans could come and work with Haitians in a way that sometimes Dominicans had trouble with. Puerto Ricans could come and work with Haitians in a way that Dominicans had trouble with because they're, they're, they're too close. They've got too much commonality. And so they tend to spar and fight. And, and this is part of the conflict between, uh, and this was an amazing thing that Peterson said about Piaget, that he wanted to resolve this issue of of science and religion and I would love to see some revolution of some resolution of of this of this culture war over the sciences and say well let's 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 tone down the rhetoric if you're a Christian first of all your one duty is to love your enemy so how well are you gonna love those evolutionists now if you're a materialist you don't have a mandate to love your enemy I, I can't tell you what to do you're gonna do what you do but if you're a Christian that's my word for you so Jonathan Walton goes in there, and if you're interested in these books, they're 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 geared towards lay persons. They're very readable. They also give you a sense of of what Old Testament scholarship is like. You'll see in the the forward to the one, the Lost World of Genesis one, Francis Collins. Francis Collins was was responsible for. He, he led the Human Genome Project. I guess there are two competing jobs, one of them. And, and he, was a, he was a doctor, and he, he wasn't a believer. And he, he, he began to be impressed by, by, by patients who prayed and their families around them. And he writes about, just go to Amazon and, or Google Francis Collin, Christian, and he writes about his story. He's one of the founders of BioLogos. I, I personally don't necessarily always like the way these people try and put science, the Bible and science together, but it's a very difficult problem. He knows way more about science than I ever will. I might know a little bit more about the Bible than he does. And here's the difficulty. What we're dealing with, by the time we get to this level of articulation, we're dealing with representations, and, and we think we know. And, and so let's say you're reading you're reading in Genesis and you're reading these stories and you say, well, and one old question was, well, what would a video camera capture? And, and we think, well, what does, what does a picture capture? And, and this was a very famous picture of, of Alien Gonzalez. And if you're too young to remember the story, just Google it. And this was a, this was a huge thing in our culture because here, this picture speaks a thousand words, but does that picture 
speak an accurate thousand words? Is the resolution high enough? One of, the, one of the things I wanted to get at is that in the Bible, there are many creation stories. Now, I'm not being a liberal here. I'm a Christian Reformed minister. I'm not a liberal. But, but when I study the Bible with, say, my Sunday school class, and I go through the book of Isaiah, I always bring them back to Isaiah 5, because this is one of the key hyperlinks in this whole story of the Bible. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. You think, how is this a creation story? Well, read on. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a, vineyard, a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Well, there's a little story about someone making a vineyard. But now there's, there's love in it. This is a song of my beloved. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and the people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than what I had done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do with my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, nor briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness but heard cries of distress. Now, I, I use this story often to as a creation story in the Bible because people will ask me, well, well, you know, what's the what's the meaning of life? Why why in the Christian story does God create the world? And I will tell them God creates it for glory. And and that creation story, it's a story of Israel and Judah, but again, if you understand the Bible, in a way, part of what the Bible does is tell the story of the world by telling the story about a people and tells the story about a person. And, and this is the way that the Bible communicates. And, you know, what's what's helpful, I think, with Peterson is is Peterson and his understanding of archetypes and mythology. He's getting this, that, that, that when we talk about Jerusalem and what, what God wants for this world, well, we're this is a story of creation. And now this doesn't say how God made the world, and it, it tells a slightly different story than Genesis 1, but, but all of the relevant questions are being answered. And again, getting back to Fennel, what are his relevant questions that his, that his cosmology has to answer for him? Now, obviously he's not going to leave the island, and I hope he doesn't try to walk off it, um, because he ain't going to get very far. But one of the things that I think about is that if you actually thought about the phenomenological map of Neil Armstrong and his trip to the moon, you don't have a globe and a ship and another globe. You probably have an alarm clock, a getting dressed, a driving to the a driving to the space center, a a putting on the clothing, all, and then you then you get into a capsule, and then you get shaken, and then you get out of it, and that's the phenomenological representation of Neil Armstrong going to the moon. But when you ask a person what the representation is, we can't help but think of a globe, and a little capsule, and another globe, and landing on it. But that's not how Neil Armstrong saw it. It was how he imagined it. It was how all of us imagined it. But that's where you get into the question of representation. And so you have to ask yourself, what representation do you need? So the contemporary flat earther, who can only maintain sobriety if he has a Bible, which is literal and and this is how we can maintain sobriety, I say, I'm not going to talk you out of a flat earth. But now, that's the flip side of Silas, Tim Stafford's son, who is no longer a Christian because he got caught in the culture war. And you can go on the internet and find a lot of people who are former Christians, and they say, I miss it. Well, what do you miss about it? I miss the consolation that when they put me in the ground, that won't be all there is. Now, again, you could be a materialist and say, well, it's time to buck up and, uh, yeah, get in touch with the fact that once you go on the ground, you're done, and 300 years from now, no one will even remember your name. 
Okay, what does that then mean for your life? Well, that gets more complicated, and I'm not going to be simplistic and say that if you don't believe in God, you don't have values. Of course you have values. And, and that's, in fact, the point of all this, is that we inhabit this world that we didn't create, and this world is far more complex. And so Peterson's getting to the point that's saying, are we driving off a cliff? Maybe we should stop and look at where we've been and look at the decisions that we've made at critical points in time. And Peterson basically declares in the next segment that, you know, I'm down with Darwin. I believe him. I'm completely convinced. What, what I've got to figure out is this, this book. And, and because I've got to figure out this book because it isn't, it isn't the case that I can just live in within the story this one story of evolution. I need my stories to come together. Again, Thomas Kuhn, when Brett Weinstein says, the material level is the top level, immediately my mind went to Thomas Kuhn. Really? That, when you say, my, the material level is the top level, you're telling a story. You're telling a science story. Now, if you if you look at the history, let's say, of physics, you have kind of the, the theory of the atom and then quantum theory, which which in some ways makes no sense. And the reason they, you know, it was tough to adopt was it made no sense, but then it tested on the laboratory. So okay, quantum theory, and you've got Newtonian mechanics, you've got quantum theory, these are all representations and and one overturns another. And so you're going to have to deal with representations, whichever side of these debates you're on. But then again, this, these are the animals that we are. Uh, my wife often reminds me, she says, you know, people don't remember what you say as much as they remember what they felt. And, and that gets into the fact that if you read, for example, Yuval Harari and his book Sapien and Homo Deus, he, he makes the point that well, he makes a lot of interesting points, a lot of which I would also love to um, talk with him about, is, you know, in many ways, this 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 unconscious is, is such a powerful asset that we have, and, and we don't appreciate it, and we can't understand it, and, you know, we know far more than we know, and this this is just a fact about us, but yet... What, what has happened is that we've had this cognitive revolution, and when we're dealing with the question of what is consciousness, here's, here's the question. What is consciousness? Consciousness is a story. And, and the scientists who look at our eyes will say, yeah, but our brain is doing this story. And you say, that's right. Our brain is doing this story. Our brain is doing this story and filling in the gaps. I'm not really looking at this world around me. I have a, I have a friend who's, who's legally blind, and, and he explained to me one time that really he's basically got this kind of idea through one eye. But when he looks, he sees the whole room because his brain is filling in all the information. And so if I wear black, which I often do on Sundays, and I come right next to him and I'm very quiet, suddenly he turns his head and poof, I appear like I dream of genie right into the picture. Well, why is that? Because his, because his brain is filling in the picture. And you might say, well, you know, well, 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 that's, that's not true. Well, it's, it's, we're dealing with resolutions here, but now we can't help but have consciousness without story. And, and so in fact, that's why I think Jung's dream is really story. And, and this gets into what Harari talks about in Sapiens about the cognitive revolution that, it, you know, a new way of thinking. Now, did this happen because of what hate put in that we, we wanted to, you know, commune with more people than we could groom? I don't know. But the appearance of new ways of thinking and communicating between 70,000 and 30,000 years ago con uh, constitutes the cognitive revolution. What caused it? We're not sure. The most commonly believed theory argues that accidental genetic mutations change the inner wirings of the brain of sapiens. Was that what did it? So why, why did our ancestors develop this track and not Chimp ancestors, why did they stall? I don't know. Christians will often say, well, God. Others will say, no, chance. Okay. I can't answer that question for you. Um, the most commonly believed theory is that chance mutation, enabling them to think in unprecedented ways and to communicate using an altogether new language. 
Um, they might call this the tree of knowledge mutation. Why did it occur in sapien DNA rather than that in Neanderthal? Now, there's debate as to whether or not Neanderthals had language, and um, most of the stuff I've been reading says yes. So, so was the differential that we can do stories and they can't? But, but the point here is that there's there's nothing more powerful for us than stories, and we cannot escape stories if we in fact want to live in this world. He goes on, legends, myths, gods, religions appear for the first time in the cognitive revolution. Homo sapiens acquired the ability to say, the lion is the guardian spirit of our tribe. Whereas, again, if the story that he tells you go through a, you go through a jungle and, and the monkeys might say lion or bird, but but now we say the lion is the guardian spirit of our tribe. Oh my, we have just expanded our world. Large, uh, the secret was probably the appearance of fiction. Large numbers of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in a common myth. This is where we get into the point that's happening in Haight's book, that, that language helps us group up with huge numbers of people. In my church every week, we have, so, so my congregation meets in the morning, and then we have some African Ang Anglicans and then some Tongans who use our facility for their worship service. And, and, and both groups, the, the, Afri the Anglicans are mostly doing English. The Tongans do a lot in their original language. And, and I just think about the, the ways that, that history brought them together. And, 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 and here we are in California and, we're connecting because of a story. And, and there's leverage in our relationships because of a story. Uh, there's accountability between us because of a story. And, and I think this is, this, is just a, this, is just a, this is just an insane thing. Uh, Harari goes on. Um, there are no gods in the, you know, and, and if you think, well, I, you know, story isn't, story isn't that powerful. Harari goes on to make the point that, Story is so powerful that the dollar is a story because, you know, I pay with a smartphone. I don't even use representations of coins and, and, and or representations of silver or gold coins or even paper. We're just telling a story together that are the numbers that are determining whether people live or die. Borders and nationality. There's no biological difference between those groups. It's all story. Story governs this world. It's, and and it's, it's inescapable, and we can't lose it, and, and we can't not have any of these stories deal with origin stories. And, and so that's where, you know, I come down with Sam, on, on Sam Harris that, and, and the materialists, and that say, well, you know, this is, the, this is the top level. And I say, no, you cannot tell me it's the top level without using a story. Which means to me, story is the top level. And what that means to me is exactly what we find in our society, the top fandoms. Whereas there might be just a few nerds and eggheads and students and, and connoisseurs of art who are looking in the Renaissance gallery. But we are spending billions of dollars to construct stories about superheroes, about, about galaxies far, far away, about James Bond, about Harry Potter and magic, about Lord of the Rings. We, we cannot... And, and, and what we see in, in humanity is that cosplay, people dress up to inhabit these stories. And I look at that, there's a great college humor video out there, college humor, religious people are nerds. And basically what he says is, Star Wars, Christianity, it's in a sense the same thing. Is it the same thing? Is it not the same thing? C.S. Lewis's big point is that he finally became, becomes a Christian because he believed Christianity is the true myth. But what does that mean? And and you know, actually, I've I've known Lewis, not known personally, but through his books, I've known him for years. And it was only, it was only in in some ways through listening to Peterson that this piece fell into place for me to understand how Lewis dealt with myth. And and so then I learned Peterson and Jung and. Ah, now I understand Lewis. Now I understand how this works. 
and and that leaves me with the world's most successful fandom why does the bible outsell everything why do we study this book why do we talk about this book why do we have religious institutions why do i stand up every sunday morning and this small group of people stands pays me to stand up and explain this book for them and how it applies to their bible and you know very much with brett weinstein's thoughts that i do this because i have to integrate and you know, you can watch my sermons on YouTube. They're all on YouTube. But uh, most of the time, I start my sermons with a contemporary example. Something happens in the world. We have to integrate it. How do we understand Roy Moore and the evangelicals? How do we understand the LGBT movement? How do we understand politics? How do we understand borders? How does all of this integrate into our story? And, and what's amazing is so we've got my church, and we've got the Anglicans, and we've got the Tongans, and I'm sure our sermons are radically different and and we're going to do it in different ways but we're all working to piece the story together because we cannot live without this story ah, i'm just about at two hours and again i i am i am just surprised i'm not surprised y'all are listening to peterson because i'm doing the same thing i don't always know why i'm listening to him i'm, I'm piecing that together here and and again I've been a fan of C.S. Lewis for years, and via Peterson, I'm starting to understand Lewis better. And I'm learning a lot of science from Peterson and some psychology, and, and, and Peterson's helping me to integrate my world. And, um, and this helps me, you know, as a pastor, one of the things that I'm, I am always working on integrating my world, because I have all of those cross pressures that are on me. And so someone comes up to me and they're a Buddhist, or they've reject Christianity, or they're an atheist, and, and they've got all their Christians. You know, if you think the fight between Christians and atheists is fierce, try the fights between Christians. Um, I mean, again, look at the Protestant Reformation and the aftermath out of that. We are piecing this story together and only a fool wouldn't look at the greatest fandom of all of human history and and the stories that have outlasted all the other stories and i just when i was preparing this video so my friend this is the bible of a homeless man that used to sleep right on my doorstep and, and I deal a lot with the homeless population and the mentally ill population. And, and what's amazing to me about them now, now, okay, you may make an argument that, you know, more of Sam Harris argument that, yeah, we're all a little nuts. And okay, we'll be a little nuts. And my, my flat earther friends who remain sober by adopting a flat earth so they can continue to inhabit this fandom, that, that, that's really important. But, but for people who are struggling on the edge of life, um, you know they're 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 trying to live and and if you are materialist and you say well well passing on the genetics and 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 survival is the bottom line well well there it is and now again you might dismiss and say well you know that's um it, it's just a crutch jesse ventura okay i i don't think so because this is this is where we're going to have to get to at some point in dealing with Jordan Peterson is that it doesn't work as a crutch unless you believe it. And, and so when I talk to people about Jesus and the resurrection, you know, the 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 ethos of Jesus is this. And I think Peterson puts it in some interesting ways, but I think he's saying a, a similar thing. Well, Jesus says, if you want to save your life, you'll have to lose it. And so you, here you have a story of a man who in a sense, in the words of the Apostle Paul, his life is poured out. And and he lives his life, um, your well-being at my expense, my enemy's well-being at my expense. And that doesn't me mean he was a pushover. He debated, and if you, again, you read the Gospels, he debated with his, his rivals and contemporaries and adversaries. But at the center of the story is a man who has been, who has been, who is being mocked, who has been stripped naked of his clothing, who is spread out, and he says, Lord, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And, and, and so when I, when I say, well, part of what it means to be a Christian is to, is, to, is, to live, is to give your life for your enemies. And if you hear that, you say, well, that's crazy because then you'll have no more life. And you say, yes, but in the Christian story, 
your life is given back to you. You say, yeah, but that only works if it's true. Right. And you can only do it if you believe it. Right. And yeah, and it's incredibly hard to live because it's incredibly complicated because we don't know what it means to love somebody. Um, if there's a homeless person who is who is sleeping on my doorstep, um, some people will say, well, 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 don't give them anything to drink. Well, okay, I won't. Uh, don't feed them because then you're supporting their lifestyle. Uh, that's hard. Loving people is hard. Loving real people is hard. Knowing what to do is hard. And this gets back then to Peterson, you know, figuring out what to do. This is what we've been watching each other to try to figure out what to do forever. All right, now I'm now I'm preaching and I'm rambling. So again, I part of me is just befuddled why anybody would sit and watch me for two hours. But then again, I sit and watch Peterson's, Peterson for two hours, and some of my friends are befuddled because they say, why do you sit and watch that guy for two hours? So thanks for listening. Um, uh, I just, thanks for listening. I don't, you know, I don't monetize my page. I'm a pastor of a church. Um, I do this partly because this is the homework I do to integrate my life in with my religious tradition and this crazy book and hopefully with the goal of of Jesus great commandment loving the Lord your God um, and loving your neighbor as yourself and neighbor as yourself goes all the way to loving my enemies so again thanks for watching and if if you want to see more of these just just post a comment that says keep them coming and I'll keep them coming for as long as I can if it's helpful. If it's if it's not helpful, well, you would have turned it off by now.